It's so nice to have you here. Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. We've got this network switch. It's completely dead. Yeah, mm. we found that out last week. Yeah, but we took it apart and we think, Sasha, that we may have found what's wrong with it. Oh. You think my mad soldering skills might be able to repair it for us this week? Of course I have full confidence in you. I ordered the capacitors, and this week we're going to take an attempt and see if we can get it to fire up. And we've got a great show planned for you. So, yeah. hey, it's always a great show. Sasha, Jeff are here, I'm here, and you are here, so you know it's going to be good. Uh, stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's episode 604 of Category 5 Technology TV. Nice to see you. Uh, just before the show, we were talking about, oh, I hope that Discord doesn't freeze up this week. Yes, we were. Uh -huh. That's been an issue that? for a while. Yeah, it has been an issue. You see that over there? Right beyond, Je just right over past you, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what am I looking at? <laughs> right, right there. Yeah. See that? This yeah. and this yeah. and, and, yeah. and that. Oh, okay, what that. We, Yes, yeah. okay. That, yeah. Yeah. Those. Sasha's you have right to just there. Like yeah. <laughs> there she is. Yeah. I, I would not do well on a game show. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or as a, or as a meteorologist. <laughs> <Yes>. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my it is, goodness. It's an amazing thing. I mean, it is powered by TitanEmbeds.com. And okay. I absolutely recommend that you check them out. But what happens is, because we broadcast for a full, uh, well, we, we broadcast for an hour, but it usually takes about a two-hour window to, yes. to put everything together yep. here in the studio. So if you're watching live. So by that time, like the, I don't know what it is, but like buffers like queue up and freeze up and, and things like that. So if I'm not actively watching this screen over here, well, Discord will lock up. Discord is our chat. Um, it's a great way for you to be able to interact with us. You can get on over to our website, category5.tv, click on interact. You'll see the Discord chat. It's also, um, interestingly, interestingly enough, it's connected to our IRC channel as well. Right. Yes. I created an IRC bridge, and that allows you to chat on IRC in our Discord channel, and then you're going to appear over here as well. Right. It's cool, but it does tend to lock up once in a while. So, you what, ready? Yeah. Okay. You know that I, I develop NEMS Linux, yes? yes? Yes. What does that mean? Well, I have a little bit of experience working with Raspberry Pis, Pine64. All the single boards. Oh, oh, yeah, all the single board computers. All of them. There's not one that I don't play with, tinker with. So... I feel like this is an SBC solution. So, I've been working with Ender Dragon, the developer of TitanEmbeds.com. Okay. And connecting with them directly and have actually created, well, we know Titan Embeds. Yeah. Now, what have I created? A Titan and Nems? No, 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 no. Almost. You're close. You're, you're, you're Ti almost there. Titan Nems? Those who are in Discord right now see a new bot. It's, who's and do we see him? Oh, Look, Titan, Titan Pie. Titan Pie. Right here in the studio, we have a Raspberry Pi microcomputer running Titan Embeds. Okay. The very software that powers TitanEmbeds.com is now ported to a Raspberry Pi microcomputer. Really? That is yes. so cool. So we now have what's called Titan Pi. And tonight is basically, I, maybe I should have waited until next week. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just finished developing this this morning. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So this is like So uh, this is fresh. like the inaugural. Yeah, like... well, because it's something that we've really needed. And, yeah. and, you know, if we're on a wireless Internet connection here, we broadcast a lot of bandwidth through the live show. So there's quite a potential for it to buffer. And then what happens to Titan is it locks up. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's how it appears to the viewers because it's, it's basically a website, a web service that if it loses its connectivity, it will just freeze. Right. Right? Okay. It's, like a, it's like a socket connection, if you will. Having the, the Titan Pi right here in the studio, 
theoretically right. means that we shouldn't have that issue anymore. So I've had it running all afternoon, and we see G Dog 1985. Yeah. We see Uber Abba. We see Marshman, and we see. All of the folks having a chat there in the in the in the Discord. Chat. I'm in the chat room. You're See? in the chat as well. <laughs> How fantastic is that? That's great. So, this is like something they've never done before. Correct. And so you have now done this for them. Uh huh. With uh, them. High five. So nice. TitanEmbeds.com. You've got to check out their service if you are a Discord fan, if you're a streamer, if you have a website and you want to embed your website's uh, Discord, for mm -hmm. example, within your actual website in such a way that it looks really great. Like, do you notice how branded that looks? There's yeah. no, there's no extra stuff. It's mm. it's clean. Yes. Because that's all part of Titan. That's well. Awesome. You can use TitanEmbeds.com or now as we work toward this, so this is like the ultimate test is putting it on the air on a live broadcast that has, you know, well, 20 plus thousand subscribers on YouTube as of this week. Wow. Welcome to LinuxTechShow.com. Hello. And plus we've got another 10,000 subscribers nearly uh, on Category 5 Technology TV on, Lin on uh, YouTube. So we're looking 30,000 subscribers on YouTube wow. watching right now. That's awesome. The ultimate test of Titan Pie. Exactly. So what's going to happen is, is that if this goes really well tonight, mm -hmm. our little Raspberry Pi microcomputer Discord embedding server from TitanEmbeds.com, mm -hmm. if it goes well... Just going to release it yeah. for free. Sweet. You yeah. can have it. So watch. See, and that's like what the show's all about. Like yeah. we go, what's broken? How can we fix it? What's great? How can we make it better? How can we make it better? Uh, how and can we share that. it? We've got to give big kudos. I mean, you hear me saying titanembeds.com and Ender Dragon and er, End and Dragon, I should say. Um, fact is, is that they released the source code publicly. Mm -hmm. For this amazing embedding system that they have for Discord, wow. you can go download it off of GitHub if you want. Now it takes a little bit of um, it takes a little bit of technical know-how to make it work. Right. And in Dragon really helped me to get it up and going. And now that I've got it up and going on what what is basically a NEMS, what we call a, a Linux um, base. Mm -hmm. um, so it's Debian Buster on a Raspberry Pi. It's now super easy to set up. Right. So now that you've done this, mm, I've right, done, and it's so we've going, done all the work. yeah. So are you going to do like a feature on it? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah why not? Just to why show not? everybody else how oh, yeah. it's done. Yeah, okay. of course. Of all course. right. We'll make it downloadable first it, as like an image file. Right. It starts with the Raspberry Pi because it's really the ultimate test. Can it work on a Raspberry Pi? Can I get a yes? I, I, you know, as you're talking about all these things that you're improving, I just I. I kind of look at you and I think, what like, a nerd! You're like the what modern a <laughs> nerd. You're like the modern day Rick Moranis from Honey I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, like I love that. I love that movie because, like, he's got a, sol a tech solution for everything, and I feel yeah. like that's you. You're like, ah, I don't like the way this works. I got to make this better, and you just sure. do it. And it's like. I don't know how to make myself breakfast some days. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I solved the world's problems. <laughs> okay, so let's back up a little bit. NEMS Linux is a very successful mm -hmm. distribution for Raspberry Pi, for Pine64, for all the different, uh, Odroid, and all the different, uh, all the different single board computers. And with that, I've released what's called the, uh, the Linux uh, Debian base. Kay. So the base is available for free on my blog. So now the base is now going to power Titan Pi. Excellent. <laughs> so, yeah. And we'll see how it works. It may freeze up tonight. We may have to restart it a couple times. I don't know. Well, we'll see. Yeah. But I, uh, fact is, is that it's going to be available anyways. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I have full faith. It's not going to freeze. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Sasha. No. I think it's frozen. <laughs> is it? <laughs> oh, it is frozen. Yeah. Jeff just posted something. It's yeah. all good. Well, that was anticlimactic. <laughs> well, we're going to take a commercial break in just a few moments, and we'll see what exactly is the cause of that. See, I'm, this is kind of the fun of open source, too, is that we're going to figure out maybe what was causing exactly. Titan embeds to freeze up, and we'll fix it, and then we'll do what's called a, uh, a pull request. 
and the pull request will then be um, added to actual like tightenembeds.com and it'll oh. help other people as well. That's the whole like the glory of open source. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. I like it. We've Me got too. a lot of fun for you tonight. Um, now um, we're going to be looking at the soldering job that I started last week. You, you notice that I'm resting my hands on this uh, on this switch. Just a quick mention: the company that I work for um, actually uh, was just awarded ESET's MVP Partner of the Year. Nice for the entire country of Canada. Well done. Check out endpointsecurity.ca. It's interesting because they've actually launched um, what's called the endpointsecurity.ca podcast. Oh. And it's an it's a f- exceptional podcast. It's professionally written. It's professionally um, put together. And they decided to use the bald nerd as the host. So it's a well lot of done. fun. But you get to learn about cybersecurity issues that are affecting businesses, and, and the focus is on Canadian business, but realistically, it's Anything. Canada, U.S., mm-hmm. wherever you are in the world. I mean, it's the same things that we're facing. We were talking about the GDPR just a couple of episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a, it's a commercially produced um, show that is available on endpointsecurity.ca, and they just won uh, the Partner of the Year for ESET. So... Beautiful. I mean, ESET's a huge international company, um, so it's, a, it's quite an honor. And uh, those of you who follow it, um, you'll also see that we received a trophy. And yeah. Yeah, I'm like all about it's, trophies. It's pretty. Yeah. We're going to need a trophy really wall. Uh, we're going to need a trophy wall here. Absolutely. And then <laughs> someone's got to start sending us trophies. Well, you know, I'm sure we can. I have an Oscar at home. Do you? Yeah. Oh, yes, right. Like the Oscar. That That was was brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) We do have to take a really quick break. When we come back, I'm going to jump over to our soldering station, and we're going to see if we can actually make this thing go. Okay. Stick around. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv slash shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. cat5.tv slash shirts. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. It's episode number 604. Now, we were checking just before the break, and you see that Discord is now, Titan Pi is now refreshed. Yes. So what's interesting there is that it now has pointed us to um, what is potentially the issue. Not necessarily Titan itself locking up, but in fact, Wirecast's web um, embedding is actually oh. locking up. So it's it, it really, now that we've got a local server, it points right. us to, okay, now we've got a new test bed. Now we've got something ah. else that we can try with, and we can realize that, oh, this is actually maybe a Telestream Wirecast issue. So there are a couple of ways that I can get around this. One is to set up a second Raspberry Pi computer or other uh, single board computer and set it up with a head. So HDMI output with Chrome loaded Mm -hmm. and then actually use that as a capture source for Telestream Wirecast because then it's not going to be affected. So keep in mind what I'm doing is I'm actually linking Telestream Wirecast to the URL, the website address Mm -hmm. of the Titan Embed server. Or in this case, now this week, Titan Pi. Right. Right. But what we have proved is that Titan Pi running on a Raspberry Pi microcomputer works exactly like you would expect. Yes. You can see it just beyond Jeff there. Now, is it possible that if it is the Telestream issue... Yes. If you were to go back to the the Titan Discord service, would it then work? So it's not... Maybe you don't necessarily need the Pi... Or does the Pi fix part of the problem? What the Pi does for us. So here's, so unrelated to Discord freezing, mm-hmm. 
that seems to be a wire cast issue, which right. we've never seen before. We've never been able to detect that before because, because it's always right. been TitanEmbeds.com. Right. right. Now that we've got a local server, we can see, oh, this is actually not TitanEmbeds.com locking up. It's this is else. Telestream Wirecast locking mm. up. Right. So would it make a difference to use our local server versus Titan Embeds? The only difference that that would make, Jeff, is that if the internet were to go down or yep. to have a problem here during a live broadcast, which has never happened since we've upgraded to Correct. Uh, yeah. a better internet service here at the studio. But if it ever happened, our, tit our Titan server would still be displayed over there. Now, mm. if it was using the out external titanembeds.com, maybe because the internet would be down, it might cause like right. a, uh, an error or a crash of some sort Something that's like unrelated that, yeah. because mm -hmm. it's internal here. At least it would just say, can't connect and can't get new messages right. and then all of a sudden internet connection comes back and boom there's the new messages right, right. Okay. so it's possible that that would make a difference so, what do you know we're troubleshooting live on the air well and that's a big part of what category five is because yeah. it's all about kind of what did i yeah. say it's ramshackle <laughs> <laughs> it really is in a lot of ways. I mean, we're looking tonight at how to make an old network switch work. Right. Talk about ramshackle. Well, Indeed. and oddly enough, I mean, the whole figuring out things live on the air, I can't, I think back to when you first did soldering and how much oh. of a debacle that was. Come on, live Jeff, on it was the air. beautiful. It was but, a thing of beauty. But because Zoomed of that... right out, it was amazing. Thank but you. But because welcome. of the community going, well, what about this? And did you have enough flux? Exactly. We fix it on the spot. That's flux? what's great about the show. What's that? Yeah, exactly. So I'm learning as we go, as we grow. Sasha, last, well, maybe, what, two weeks ago, you stuck around after the show. Yes. And so those who are on our Patreon channel, uh, who, are, who are patrons of the show and watch the live feed, those of you who are watching live know that we did a little bit of a soldering session after the show. Mm -hmm. And I learned from that session that, you know what, I need flux for desoldering. Mm -hmm. Not just for soldering, but for desoldering as well. And we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be using that tonight in order to uh, to do a better job, if you will, of hopefully making this thing work. So this is a 10 over 100 16 port network switch. This switch was given to us because, hey, it doesn't work and maybe Category 5 can figure out how to make it go. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Three years later, we pulled it out of the back <laughs> the back office and said, "Okay, well, I'm let's see what now. we can." Yeah, <laughs> now we're ready. We bought Flux and we're ready to go. So I'm going to jump over here and we're going to see uh, what I can come up with. So over here, uh, we've got all the parts out just like we did last week, and you see, I got the. Uh, r the capacitors in from Amazon. These are a dollar sixty per capacitor. So we're going to find out if this is going to be worth our while. Here is the power supply, Jeff. You remember me taking this out? Yes. Yeah. First thing I want to do is I want to check if there is a charge on these capacitors. So um, the old capacitors. I mean, they're only ten volts, but w so we're basically doing this for. Uh, you know, you may be dealing with three hundred volt capacitors. In our case, okay, they're giving, they're registering DC volts of zero. There is a big capacitor on here. Let's check that one. And it registers 0 0.002 volts. I'm not going to get a shock from that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mentioned that I might want to show you how to discharge um, a capacitor. At 10 volts, you're, you're probably not going to get a shock from that anyways, and you could probably short circuit it and just uh, and it will discharge safely, uh, especially because of the fact that I'm not going to be reusing these capacitors. I'm actually going to be pulling them, so I'm not too concerned about, uh, about them. It, but you may want to look on YouTube. There are better uh, people than me to teach you that. I need to make sure, because I'm going to be doing desoldering, I need to make sure my soldering iron is reasonably hot. So a little bit hotter than when I'm soldering, especially because I'm going to be using a, a wicking, um, like a desoldering wick, in order to remove this solder. I've got my helping hands here, and I'm curious if this is going to help me or hinder me. <laughs> it looks a little bit like <laughs> I probably by be name, holding too well by right name now. alone it should be helping <laughs> you would you would expect so so okay, all right so do I des desolder now do I start heating things up no 
<clears throat> what I need flux. to do first, yeah, Jeff, you hit it. We need some rosin paste flux. So what this is going to do, this is like a little paste that I'm gonna I'm gonna put on the solder joints. I need to put this on before I desolder as well as soldering because this is going to protect those solder joints from uh, from the heat in, in such a way that it, you know I'm still going to be able to use those solder joints. So. It, you know, we're, d we're dumbing it down here today because I'm dumb when it comes to this kind of stuff. I'm learning. Are, are you using a stir stick? I am using a stir stick. <laughs> and that, that leads me to my next point, Jeff. You can purchase some amazing tools for applying flux. Or you can run to your local coffee shop and grab a coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know what? You don't need anything fancy for this, <laughs> folks. And in fact, I'm using my hands here. You might want to be careful here. I've got a 400 degree soldering iron. Uh, I'm going to be pretty quick with this, so I'm, I'm not afraid that I'm going to burn myself, but uh, this is probably not the wisest way to do it. Uh, if, I can admit if you're that. from a health and safety company, stop yeah. watching. <laughs> stop watching now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what I need to do is, uh, with the flux on there, I'm, I'm heating up those soldering joints to pull off that capacitor. So that's one of the dead capacitors. Okay. Um, easy peasy. That's what we looked at last week. And let's grab the other one on. And through the magic of television, I can actually speed this up a little bit for you. And there you go. Let's get a quick look at the capacitor itself. So that's blown. You can see how that's been burst. Yeah. And that is a 10 volt, 1000 microfarad capacitor. So I ordered the, the replacements off of Amazon at $1.60 each. They were $8 for five of them. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually put those on there. So let's, let's get some more, uh, some more flux some more paste on there. Some flux. Now, Jeff, because we're working with flux and capacitors, does that make this a flux capacitor? Uh, you know what? I, I, I think, think it does. So. Excellent. <laughs> I, I really think it does. <laughs> this is a desoldering wick. Oh, and what this this is why I need my soldering iron uh, about 50 degrees hotter than if I was soldering, uh, because I'm actually going to remove the solder from those joints. So just by applying the heat to the wick, now it's actually pulling the solder out of that. And and oh. wick that's is what it's, so cool. Yeah, it just kind of sucks it right out of there. <laughs> so just give it a, a quick second. You can actually feel. The, the solder turned to liquid underneath the wick, and, and that's when you can pull it away. That's awesome. There you go. So see, those holes are wide open now. Get the, uh, the second set there from the, uh, from the other capacitor. There's two identical 10-volt capacitors that I need to re redo. You know, as you're just uh, pulling that solder off, Marshman doesn't like our Back to the Future joke. Oh, come on now. It was good. I thought it was good. <laughs> you know it was good. <laughs> this is some good TV right here. Yeah. You all know right. we're hilarious. So, <laughs> so have you removed all the solder now? Yes, the solder's gone. Here, let me show you, Jeff. Okay. So I'm just cleaning out the flux paste there, and you see those holes there? Yeah. Oh, so so clean now out. it's nice and clean, right? Wow. But because I use the flux, it's not damaged. Right. So I'm going to, and notice I'm doing this in, in double time. I've got uh, two replacement capacitors here. Same thing, 10 volt, 1,000 microfarads, or as I said last week, UF, which I said just to be safe, and, and because that's what I ordered off of Amazon. You'll notice that it has a negative side, and it's important to make sure that you get the uh, the polarity correct. And I'll show you a little bit. Of, I'll show you how. Obviously, I, I double-checked that when I took off the other one. But notice the, the minus sign yes. on one side. And also the, the leg, the shorter one is negative and the longer one is positive. Okay. Is so that just always? Well, not always. Sometimes they come mm. a, and they're not, it's not quite as obvious what huh. the polarity is. But you should have, uh, I, haven't, I, I think I've always seen them with the negative side. See how it's painted on there? Um, but the leg should be positive is longer. And I've just bent the legs a little bit to hold them in place for, for soldering. Oh, that makes sense. Smart. Yeah, it works. Tighten those up, make sure that they're in there good. And more flux. Nice. Flux capacitors. Looks so much like hair wax. It doesn't, <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't apply like paint. <laughs> so just <laughs> heat up that flux a little bit. That's going to just like turn it into a liquid. There you go. 
And, and again, that just protects the joints and makes sure that um, you're not overheating the joints. And, and I don't know, it's some kind of magic. Um, and uh, it does. It, it really helps to make sure the solder works really, really well. Mm -hmm. Though here, I'm not having quite as much success. Looking at the uh, tip of my soldering iron, um, it's kind of it's kind of wound Donkey. up on the end of the tip, which I want to avoid. Uh, so I'll just grab my just like a dollar store wire cleaner there and uh, clean off the tip. You don't have, to, again, you don't have to buy the $30 uh, soldering component to, to clean off the tip of your soldering iron. You know, and you're starting to make this look really easy. Well, I'm trying, Jeff. I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit better. I'm so I'm heating it up a little bit, it. heating it up, heating it up, and then applying the solder and pulling up. And now we've got a good joint there. Let's heat it up, heat it up, heat it up, and then apply the solder. There we go. And nice. Right? Do the same thing on this one. And there we go. Perfect. All right. Okay. Now, I guess, you know, final quick little wipe there. Now, I only had some, some paper towel handy. You probably want to get some nicer cotton wipes or something like that. But there you go. There's, there's my that soldering job. Good. Much cleaner. Right, Sasha? Yeah. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. There we oh go. Oh, my. Okay. Well so done. Now we're going to grab our, our snips here and get rid of the excess on the uh, capacitors there. You the know. The legs of the capacitors. Beaut. So if this works, we've taken what would be a $50 replacement, and we've pulled this thing out of the landfill. And for, what, just, uh, just over $3, the cost of a good cup of coffee, we've replaced the capacitors. And, uh, and hopefully we're good to go. Now, I've got some isopropyl 99.9% .9 pure alcohol. This is just to kind of clean up that uh, residue of the flux that's been and that's applied not gonna, to the board. It's not going to hurt it? No, that won't hurt it, Sasha. Okay. Um, that will actually just, that's just a, a cleaner, a solvent to clean off. Let's just get this open. It's a brand new bottle. So this is just going to clean off the flux a little bit. Again, I've only got paper towel handy. Uh, you want to have something a little better than that. I, I'll buy a couple of nice cloths in order to, to do my cleanup. But that'll just help to dissolve the, uh, the residual flux. And it's not going to be perfect with a paper towel, but it, it'll at least get the job done mm -hmm. for today. All right, let's get a look at that, see how that looks. All right, there we go. So the kind of the orange co discoloration, that's the flux itself. So I got to, you know, I could do a better cleaning job. But there you go. There's my capacitors installed with the correct polarity. Ha <laughs> ha. Soldered right on there. And my solder joints look just as good as the ones that uh, are on the board. So I'm happy about that. And uh, let's get doing some cleanup. Okay. All right, cleanup complete, and we are ready to go. That's the final product. There you are. Look at that. So beautiful brand new dollar <laughs> sixty capacitors <laughs> on my power circuit. So this is the transformer circuit that I'm reinstalling into the network switch. Now, should you have not checked to make sure that the uh, there was electrical current to make sure you did this right, or did how so, Jeff? Well, do you know, like, first when we checked to make sure that there was no charge or anything, is, should you, is there a way to check to make sure that the capacitor you used is valid? Oh, like that I made a good joint? Yeah. Well, I should be able to tell when I, it, like, I connected it, and I, I didn't damage the, uh, the, the, like, where I was soldering it into on the circuit board. Right. And so I made good contact there, and I can tell that by visually looking. Okay. Um, so it should be good, but we'll find out. So let's put back together. Capacitors are in. Let's find out if it is actually successful. We're going to do that right after the break. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, 
You'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners and thank you for watching. Welcome back to Category 5 Technology TV. We have finished soldering the capacitors. We? we <laughs> it was all me. I, it's a team effort. I Come was on. here cheering you on. Yeah, anyway, thanks, let's buddy. go back over to Robbie, see what he's got going on <laughs> at the solder right. table. Okay, okay, let's jump over to this. So I've got everything put together. I'm going to put the chassis back together here because I am believing in the job that I have done here today. Thank you, Marshman, for the blue smoke. It's not happening today. Come on. <laughs> I really... Come on. I, I, did a, I did a decent job. I, I think, think it, I think it's going to work. I think it's going to work. Okay. So there it is. It's all back together. Let's grab the power cable and, moment of truth, let's throw 110 volts into this bad boy. Looking for the smoke. Uh -huh. Well, I put the case on, so you're not going to see any smoke. Oh! oh power! Oh! Huh. Oh, oh light. Yay. We got the power. I see the light. All right, but no other lights are on because we have no Ethernet cables plugged in. Let's see if I can track down a hot Ethernet cable here. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> that was quick. To the back of computer. <laughs> oh, through the magic of television, my friend Jeff. Uh, All right, let's plug it in. Let's see what uh, what's going to happen here. All right. Click. And click. And number one is lit up. Yes, yeah. sir. Oh, man. Ah, look at that. Let's move it around. Let's see if we've got a good 10 over 100 switch here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Five is lit up. Look at us. Look at how smart we are. Wow. Oh. oh. Wow. The things that get us excited. I Lights. Know. <laughs> hey, look at this. Well, you know why I'm excited here, Jeff? Because now you can use it for the studio? This was going to be... No, this is for my Raspberry Pis, for my Pine 64 boards. Look at that. This is This great. is for all my SBCs. I have 14 of them. Yeah, you need 16. <laughs> yeah, I really do. All right. Wow. That's exciting. I'm going to jump right back over. Um, so, I mean, you said it was, what, about $3 in parts? So, here's the thing, Jeff. This is it. So, $50 would replace this network switch. Right. Mm -hmm. And sure, okay, that's what we're tempted to do. Or maybe like twenty to forty dollars, I could replace the power circuit board um, that is built into that, and mm -hmm. and then I could replace that, and I'd feel like, hey, it was a bit of a DIY job. Or for a dollar sixty per capacitor on that's Amazon, awesome. uh, and it only took two days to arrive, and, yeah. and I can fix it myself, very potentially. Now, this was a very, very simple fix, and I was right. fortunate in this case that it happened to be a simple fix. Having removed the cover from it last week, I saw, you and I saw together. Yeah, it was just that, that small little yeah, board. Yeah, it was a small little board, and it was pretty obvious that there were two capacitors that were burnt out on that yeah. board. Yeah, the nice little bubble on the top. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But isn't that often the case? Well, yeah. It quite often is. And so you take it to a repair shop, and you'll pay $100 or $200 to get something fixed. Or in this case, it's like, okay, well, it's only $50 to replace it. Let's just buy a new one. Mm -hmm. no. Well, for $3 and change, I bought the parts. And saved it from the landfill. And saved it from, that's it. I could replace it or I could, it, what I, but it would still, like, mm -hmm. that's not going to biodegrade. Right. Well, E-waste will recycle it, sure. But right. But even at the same time, just the time that it took to do that, it was probably less time than hopping in the car, heading to the store, picking out the model that's that you true. want to replace, yeah. coming back. Like, in that same time frame, like, if you just had the capacitor sitting around at home, yeah, uh, you know, you'd be like, oh, I... This is faster than going to the store. Absolutely. And actually, in the, in the chat, I was looking back at the chat um, last week. Marshman said, well, didn't you go to Say Al, and did they not have the capacitors? And it was exactly that. It's like, if I can sit down on Amazon right. and buy it for $1.60 a cap, and it'll be here two days later. And, right. and here we are. A week later, we've, we've Fixed made it. the repair. And that now all your SBCs so so will be cool. happy. Yeah. You yeah. fixed two big things. I, I did it. <laughs> You're like, a fix it. Uh, fix it, guy. Well, and, and you, can, you can laugh, or you can be like, whoa, Robbie sucks at soldering. And whoa. so I, <laughs> this being you, this is your thoughts that I'm putting into your head. I can do this. I can take something <laughs> apart, and I can figure out how to fix it. Right. 
And it's like, that is liberating. Sure it yes. is. That is exciting because I have a big old TV that's sitting here. Yeah. Jeff, do you want to grab a sign of this? Here, hold on. <clears throat> Why don't I just do it this way? Oh, we, we got go. a big old TV right here that was given to us for free. Yeah. Because its power supply has a burnt out what? Capacitor? Capacitor. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yay. That's a beast. That's yeah. heavy. But it's, <laughs> it's a free TV. But I have to buy a $1.60 capacitor for it. I don't know if you And can I think that. I can do it. I Patrons, think I can do we it. We need your. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please don't. <it. laughs> we need to fix it. Um, so, I mean, all that to say, hey, we did it here live on the show, um, a little bit more than real time, but uh, but it can be done. Hey, yeah. yes. I can do it. You can do it. Um, you just got to have the right tools. So, a couple of things that I needed in order to make this repair happen. Of course, there's the dollar sixty capacitors. Mm hmm. You need to buy the right capacitors. Um, I wanted to have a soldering iron that I could adjust the temperature of. Now, we've reviewed that on our show before. You can go yes. to cat5.tv slash solder, and you'll be able to pick one of those up. They're really inexpensive, the one that I picked up, uh, because I'm just a beginner. I don't need to invest in the $200 model. Right. I just need a entry level, like, let's get started, let's learn our way through, and, and let's tinker with some cheap stuff that I've got for free and, mm -hmm. and invest $3 and change in order to see if I can make it work. Mm -hmm. You need to have flux. You absolutely do. And I learned that here on the show because our community came together and bashed me to <laughs> death. <laughs> <laughs> for not using flux. With love. Yeah, it was it was for good intentions. Well, no. <laughs> He's um, still in therapy. They, yeah, there's a couple thumbs down on YouTube, and that's okay, because I'm learning, and that's that's all. Yeah, uh, but and there's always those YouTube You have to have there. flux. That's going to help. Um, and then we've also, uh, we've got to have, uh, now I use lead-free solder, um, so you do have to have some solder as well. Um, I, I have that nice little mat that I'm mm -hmm. using, um, which basically protects any surface and prevents heat um, from from getting uh, onto your table. Right. Um, and then I've got a helping hands, which helps me to hold the soldering iron while it's hot, um, and also, in some instances, helps with the with this like actually holding the circuit board or whatever right. you're working on. In this case, it was a little more of a hindrance than anything, but that's because I was working with a big clunky board. But um, and really, remember that's to have your 4K unboxing cam ready. There you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's all you need. And then you will go viral, which I need your help to do. <laughs> so. <laughs> all right. So there you have it. We've made the fix. Um, and we're going to head right over to the newsroom because it's oh. all about you now. I am ready. All right. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp experienced outages on Sunday, which brought down their systems worldwide for over two hours. Now, single point of failure is being blamed, and we're looking at decentralized solutions like Bitcoin for an answer. Microsoft has admitted that its Outlook.com security breach was worse than the company initially revealed. Sony has finally released the details about its upcoming PlayStation 5 console. And we've got a sneak peek of the Nintendo theme park opening next year. And yes, it has real life Mario Kart. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Jeff Weston. Yaman. Yeah, you're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Facebook, Instagram, 
and WhatsApp experienced outages on Sunday, which brought down their systems worldwide for over two hours. Now, single point of failure is being blamed, and we're looking at decentralized solutions like Bitcoin for an answer. Part of the problem with many of the online services we use today is that they run on centralized servers. Technology giants are stockpiling data on our activity in massive warehouses without... Without colossal servers, all of our online services and websites today wouldn't be able to run. It's no surprise then that they so often can fall victim to outages. Once a centralized server fails, the entire system fails until it is properly repaired. In the case of Facebook, an outage also means downtime for both Instagram and WhatsApp users. It's a serious liability that a single point of failure could potentially shut down three of the most used social media services. Mm -hmm. Decentralization has the adverse effect of of always being available. As Twitter user at Ramp Capital LLC humorously tweeted, Bitcoin never suffered a worldwide outage. <laughs> it's a valid point. Bitcoin has been continuously running since it was first released over 10 years ago. It's gone through complete price collapse twice, hard forks, harsh wars, media cycles, and all kinds of inner disputes. Such controversy would likely kill any, t any kind of centralized project from the get-go. Yet Bitcoin has not stopped mining blocks and has continued to run non-stop ever since the first, very first block. That's an achievement that no centralized server can even hold a candle to. Of course, blockchain-based networks like Bitcoin can't handle the complexity Facebook currently serves. However, it's a real example that decentralized systems are self-regulating and self-functioning. That's because there's simply no single point of failure. That fact that the Bitcoin can stay resilient for over a decade without experiencing a single outage is a testament that decentralization works. Mm, so true. Mm-hmm. I think about um, like how I'm using uh, BitTorrent yeah. in order to decentralize the downloads of NEMS Linux. Right. And some folks don't quite get that yet. I'm still getting people saying, oh, well, I want a direct download, which is a single point of failure. But if things are on BitTorrent and, and big files, like images of NEMS Linux, for example, mm -hmm. you're... you're it doesn't matter if my server's down. It doesn't matter if right. such and such servers are down because there's 30 of them. Right. And it's decentralized and it'll just grab from whatever one it's available on. And if the internet could also similarly take that approach, mm -hmm. it's difficult because the technology maybe isn't quite there yet. I mean, we've got uh, content distribution networks is probably the closest I can come up with to that. Mm -hmm. Like uh, uh, being able to have your content on many different cloud servers right. and then serving up from whichever one is available that's that's kind of close but i'd assume that since this outage mm -hmm. facebook is going to change its ways because i think being down for two hours with you know instagram whatsapp facebook that's it yeah right like that's a lot of unhappy millennials <laughs> 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 And <laughs> it's tough, too, when a company r builds itself up to the point where it owns all those. And, and okay, we're going to put it on our infrastructure. So mm -hmm. now we own Instagram. Right. So let's put it on our Facebook infrastructure. Well, then what happens, right? Right. And th the truth of the matter is, I mean, they're also a service that has branded itself to like be addictive. Like it's made itself so that people want to be checking it all the time. Mm some things you could go two hours without checking when i was on facebook that was least like me i i was on it all the time so two certain hours i would notice though? yeah and certain services like you think about google mm -hmm. for example well google oh man if they is, went down for two hours. well they're provisioning basically that they, they are to a lot of novice internet users who don't quite understand how urls work google is the internet the internet mm -hmm. yeah. essentially a and that's to a non-savvy computer user but also a lot of businesses are using them for email mm -hmm. when outlook.com went down guess what loads of businesses oh were affected goodness, yeah. and not just outlook like you're looking like not just email but also calendaring um shared files things like that all of a sudden be becoming unavailable so single right. point of failures are a really big catastrophic issue for business mm -hmm. i think where it's tough i mean we're we're dealing this week with a, a customer server who uh, again on site has a single point of failure they've got their file server and the file server's motherboard died. Right. Okay. And so now we have no access to our file sharing. 
Ooh. But that's on site. So we know, okay, well, it's on the hard drives. The data's there. We can get up and running. We can move the data onto other servers and, and actually have access to it. Or we can restore it to another uh, file sharing server and, mm -hmm. and be able to access it. But when it's in the cloud, it's just, oh, it was up one moment and now it's not. Right. Where's my data? Where is that? Right. How yeah. can I, how can I hmm. stop gap? To the point where, okay, so that motherboard in the, in the ser main server needs to be replaced. Well, okay, well, we can pull a drive and we can plug it into a, another computer and boot it up and share those files to you. Well, that's great. That's a stopgap. But where's the stopgap when it comes to a cloud-based service where if it's down, it's just down? Yeah. You have no access to it. You can't pull a drive and move it onto another server. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it's you can't get available. a hold of that cloud service company, you're... And you can't. Yeah. I, I challenge you to give a call to Google. <laughs> call up Facebook. <laughs> give Facebook a call and see if you can get support. D yeah. Isn't it, don't they like not have phone numbers listed? Even if you found a phone number, you're not going to get a hold of anyone. And if you did, they're not yeah. going to be helpful. And that's a big part of the, it's a bit of a, a bit of, it's a, it's a problem. Yeah. That the biggest companies that rule our world with all these technologies cannot be gotten a hold of. Right. If the services are down, so say email, mm. how would you then get a hold of someone who only has email? Has email. Well, I mean, you think about when we've had power outages because of weather and stuff, and like yeah. cell towers are down. I mean, how? And I realize that's a localized issue to that cell mm -hmm. tower, but you have no cell signal for mm -hmm. people who use data on their phones. And most people have gotten away from, in some cases, computers at home. They're doing everything on their tablets and all that now. Yeah. Um, so it's like, if all that disappears, how do you reach anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and we've kind of got to this point in society where, you know, it's like the lights would go out and people used to walk across the roads like, Hey, your lights are out. Is everything okay? Now it's like, <gasps> we've got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then they sit there and freak out. We, we're very dependent as well. And yep. I think maybe that's what has to shift. Mm -hmm. Maybe our dependency has to shift a little bit in, in that if things were offline, could we continue operating or at least be sensitive enough to the fact that it's offline? Yeah. Here in Canada, when the power was out oh. for, what, 48 hours? Yes. Years ago. It was years, years ago. ago. Uh, here in Canada, when the power was <laughs> it, 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 it affected the country. It was but incredible. It it was, I mean, it was it, but it affected raw, the whole country. Practically all of Ontario, which is a massive wasn't amount of... Wasn't it the east side? I think because it had to do with, that was the big transformer explosion in New York or something, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and like the whole the domino effect just kind of <laughs> gone. All I know is I couldn't shop at Walmart. Yeah, because of a squirrel, I think. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, it was a squirrel. It was, I think it was a squirrel. That but when that kind of stuff squirrel. happens, it's like okay, we can either choose to come together and work together, right, and come up with solutions, or we can freak out. Oh, exactly. Really, and and let's not freak out. Let's let's work together, and 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 I think you know I see that when when servers go down and stuff, and yeah. customers are are patient and okay, we understand that this is something that needs to be worked through. Mm -hmm. So let's be those people that you know. Okay, well I understand this is going to take time. Yeah. Uh, right. And let's let people do their jobs, and and I think that's going to maybe make things a little easier to so. cope with. Well. Probably most of the people needed a two-hour break from Facebook anyway. Like, but where are they going to post yeah. their food pics? Yeah, Twitter. That's true. Okay. <laughs> Twitter's not owned by Facebook yet. Yet. <laughs> See how I did that? Microsoft has admitted that its Outlook.com security breach was worse than the company initially revealed. The software maker started notifying some Outlook.com users late on Friday night that a hacker was able to access accounts for months earlier this year. Microsoft's notification revealed that the hacker could have viewed accounts, email addresses, folder names, and subject lines of emails, but in a separate notification to other affected users, the company also admitted email contents could have been viewed. Microsoft discovered that a support agent's credentials were compromised for its webmail service, allowing unauthorized access to some accounts between January 1st and March 28th, 2019. Motherboard claims the accounts could have been used by the hackers to reset iCloud accounts linked to stolen iPhones. So far, Microsoft is refusing to reveal how many accounts were affected. Another hack attack. <laughs> it's like, 
I feel like this is every week. It's like, okay, all what right do we now. say? It's like, oh, that's shocking. Unbelievable. Now it's believable. It happens all the time. Here's the thing now. Yeah. So it's saying that people are being notified if they've been affected. Just assume if you have Outlook.com that you've probably been affected. And then th just make that assumption. Mm -hmm. Also make the assumption if you have any email anywhere that probably at some point you too will be affected. So make sure that you remember <laughs> that sensitive information shouldn't go in emails. <laughs> but yet it does. I, and I your contacts, right? Yeah. We just had a conversation about how the world seems to revolve around social media <laughs> and all these services that, you know, big business owns. Mm. And then it's like, oh, so don't put sensitive in. Where do you put it? Carrier pigeons? Right. Like, Why, yes, Jeff. <laughs> you know, oh. do we go back to the espionage days of like a little chalk mark on a fire hydrant? And oh, exactly. Look, look at that. <laughs> Don't How do you send the that? The only safe place. <laughs> That's right. Don't Data be. Traveler 2000 yeah. from Kingston Technology. You know, yeah. it's, the sad thing about this story is from a company the size of Microsoft, you would think That's it. that they would A, have noticed this earlier, and B... Fest up? Well, be a little bit more open about how many people were impacted. Your approach, though, Jeff, is like you would think that Microsoft would do better. Well, that's the problem. We all think... So Microsoft will do better. So we have Google to stop will do thinking. better. <laughs> Facebook will do better. No, Assume just because of the size of the company? No, it just makes them a bigger target. Just, yeah. Assume the worst and be pleasantly surprised when you're wrong. No, like protect yourself and, uh, mm. you know, and make sure you check to see whether or not any of these breaches have been made. Haveibeenowned.com. Yeah. Is a great service that will help you to see. I mean, but how do you, like verification.io. Mm -hmm. How many of us had information in this database that we didn't even subscribe to? We didn't right. even know we were a part of. Well, mm -hmm. we're there. See, so three people from my own office, and we're a small office. Oh, really? We're on the verification.io exploit. Wow. And you probably were too. I mean, it's huge. Yeah. Huge. See, what I like, is, like, I, I have... Um, I subscribe to a password uh, keeper software. Okay. Right. Um, Which one do you use, if I may ask? Because that's a hot topic uh, I use right now. Oh. Is it? I use Dashlane. Uh, I buy the premium subscription okay. every year. And one of the things I like about it is you that pay they pay for it. I pay, I pay for mine now, what? too. I pay for it. And one of the things I do like is it has dark web monitoring. And so I regularly... Uh, can go in and see if any of my information has been found on the dark web from okay. any breach, and it can, t it can tell me hmm. what's been stolen. Nice. Where that's it's all been part of your password manager. All part of my password manager nice. tells me where okay. it was stolen from and when it was stolen. Hmm. I just got an alert the other day that um, uh, one of my um, email accounts had popped up on a dark web breach from three years ago and it was wow. finally accessed in February. Do you know why I love that in your password manager? Is it immediately prompts you to change your password. Oh, yes. Look at that. Dropbox was exploited and my password from 10 years ago when I used to use Perfect. Dropbox was exploited. Go and change it. Yep. Yes. That's great. Yeah, and I like that. And it also interacts to go, okay, you have this service mm -hmm. that was hacked at this point and that email address is used for this other one that's been hacked. Mm. You want to make sure, like, we've checked and your passwords are similar. They're not the same, but they're similar. Maybe they have the hashes of the password. You How would they do that? Well, well, because it's the password keeper, so it stores it within there. So, I mean, if I use, like, one, two, three, four, five, six. Does it actually do that, though? Does it tell you if your password is similar on other sites? It has, t it has told me this is a similar password. You want to change it. So mm. that they're not close. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I like that. Do you that. just use the password generator then? Uh, I can use the password generator. I, I use it sometimes. Sometimes I have a system. I have to explore this service. But the reason that I don't like what you're saying right now yep. is because if they know that the password is similar, then they know what my password is. Any yes. password manager should not know what my password is. I, well, Period. I don't, yes. I don't know how the system works, but I, I do know hashes. that... Hashes. Hashes are fine. Sure, take a, take a hashed, like, encrypted password and compare it to another one and be able to tell if it's identical. Mm -hmm. Right. But if it's similar, oh, like, if I say maybe, maybe password it is that one... It's, maybe it is that it's the same. I thought it was that it was similar. Maybe it is that it's the same. Let, let me give you the, the, what, I'm, what I mean, okay. so that, just so it's clear. So password one, two, three yep. versus password one, two, three, four. 
if I if I know what those passwords are, I can compare them and say, oh, those are really close. Right. Now, if I instead have the hashes, the mm-hmm. encrypted versions of those, they're going to be completely different. Right. Because they're 256-bit AES right. encrypted. They are not at all similar because their binary data is completely different. Right. There is no connection between them, and it will never be able to tell that. If It, it could tell if the two passwords are exact because the hashes, the, the Maybe that is checksums will be the same. Maybe that's what it was then. Okay. That they were the same. That I... I would appreciate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do because get that alert. If, if I was to find out that Dropbox was exploited, and I use that example because it was, mm-hmm. and then it said, by the way, you are also using that password on this, 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 and this site. Right. That's yeah. scary because I know that now someone else has my password, but immediately from my password manager's perspective, it shows me I need to change the passwords on those sites as well. Right. Right. If I've used the same password on multiple sites. Yeah. Just so right. I want to be clear about that. Yeah, I, I will go home and take a look and confirm, okay. but you could be right on that one because I know every once in a while I get a, an alert that's like, oh, you're not 100% secure anymore. You're like 99% secure because you've used the same password. Right. So... Mm-hmm. And, and when I create my master password for a password keeper. <laughs> you remember it? When I create the master password, that becomes part of the encryption key. Right. So yes. then the password manager company themselves cannot read. They don't know what my password is yeah. because they don't know what my, what my key is. Yeah. That I created this, my own private key. Mm-hmm. It's part of the hash. Mm-hmm. So, so they should only be able to compare checksums, not... Passwords. I, I will confirm that. Okay. So, but what I do like about the service is it's cross-platform. So if I pull up something in on my computer, mm-hmm. and now uploads to my phone, so that if I go to the site on my phone, I can. It's like oh, mine like does that. that. It's great. LastPass does some great stuff as well. That's what yeah. I use. But I am looking for something alternative to yeah, that. I love Dashlane. L- LastPass recently updated themselves, and I hate it. Yeah, so if I LastPass is watching. The the latest update is garbage. I had LastPass for one of my email addresses, couldn't remember my master password, made a new email address, um, forgot that password too, and I realized LastPass is not for me. Clearly, I cannot remember the password. So I remember we did like episode way, way back, and it was like, Pass, was it called Password Box? Yeah. And they got bought oh, out by... Uh, Intel. That's who I'm Intel with. Security. Yeah. So, you, yeah. so you're with Intel Security's... Uh, yeah, what's it called? It's like a blue... blue a true key, I think. True key. Yeah. True yeah, key. Yeah, that's right. That's who I'm with because... Yeah. Turkey. I remember that password and they <laughs> let me in. <laughs> so okay, I'm so with them. That's one of the cool things about Dashlane is I can set up a um, somebody to take over my account. Like say I end up passing away. My wife is on the account okay. as somebody who mm-hmm. she can contact Dashlane to say, "Yes, he's no longer able to access this. I don't have his master password. And she's already authorized on the account so that then after a 48-hour check, mm-hmm. they can transition the account to her. Mm-hmm. Give her access. Must have dual hashing. Uh, I don't know how it works, but, mm-hmm. but I do like that service because, I mean, with all the like, web-based services we use nowadays, it's like, my wife's like, I don't know the passwords. I'm like, I have over 150. I don't know the passwords either. Mm-hmm. But I've yeah. got the master password. And yeah. Remember that, though. Oh, I remember it. <laughs> I definitely remember your master password, folks. Yeah. Sony has finally released the, de- the first details about its upcoming PlayStation 5 console. Gamers have been waiting patiently to find out any information about PS4's replacement, but until now, details have been kept firmly under wraps. Now, Sony's system architect, Mark Cerny, has released information about the next-gen console, revealing it will be much faster, more powerful, and include improved audio. Good news for avid PlayStation users, the new console will include a high-speed solid-state hard drive. While that won't mean much to a lot of people, the The point of the SSD is to dramatically reduce things like loading times, which will make everyone's gaming experience a bit better. For example, when playing Spider-Man on PS4, it can take up to 15 seconds to fast travel between different locations. Cerny showed the same task just taking 800 milliseconds on the new machine. Another big focus for the next-gen console is 3D audio. PS5, which isn't the official name of the new console, will see gamers being immersed in audio from above behind and beside and it will be best experienced through headphones 
The next PlayStation supports ray, supports ray tracing graphics. The first time a game console has ever managed graphics like it. They're usually used in Hollywood special effects and occasionally in high-end processors. It means users of the next-gen PlayStation will receive much better and more realistic visuals. It's also worth noting that while the PS5 will have all of these improvements, you don't need to worry about compatibility with PS4 games. The new console will still take physical discs and gamers can still play PlayStation 4 games on the new console. Don't expect to be able to buy one in 2019. You'll have to wait until at least next year to see it on shelves, and we don't yet know how much it will cost. So let me get this straight. The PS4 has a spinning hard drive? Yes. Yeah. You so can hear it. Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. See, I, I still it's have like my PS3 at home. I just I couldn't spend the money to upgrade the to the PS4 because then I would lose all my access to my games. Oh, because they weren't backwards compatible. That's right. Oh. Yes. So, Ouch. Yeah. so they've maybe improved that with the PS4 to PS5. And the PS4 to PS4 so. Pro. Th those are backwards compatible too. Yeah. So. But still, I mean, it, it sounds quite... <laughs> follow me, camera guy? <laughs> it, right. it's, I mean, it still sounds like it's great and I'm excited about that uh, you know, the high-end graphics. You know, it'll be interesting yeah. to see what they do, and it'll be interesting to see if they pull out some sort of, like, AI graphics development in well, the software for some games. I'm excited for it to get even better because we just upgraded from a PS4 to a PS4 Pro, and, like, the sunlight beams in the games oh. are just magnificent. Like, it's such a cool graphics upgrade, just that alone. Wow. So here we are <laughs> for the next one. I'm and just... And I uh, hear yeah. somebody unveiled last week that they're working on a 16K television. <laughs> huh. Oh, yeah. Huh. 16K. Yeah, I mean, this thing's like 17 feet wide. It's bigger than a bus. Yeah, it requires two stories. Whole. Two stories of a building. Yep. What? Could you imagine? <laughs> so you need a PS5 for that. Your PS3 probably won't provide the same resolution. Probably exactly. not, but yeah. I still like my retro pie. Retro That's pie true. My Retro Pie. Odroid Go. Odro I was just going to say, yeah. Odroid Go is like a hit at my house. Yeah, I love it. The so. kids love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo fans, you may want to update your bucket list. The world's first Super Nintendo theme park is set to open its doors next year. The $351 million venture will offer heaps of excitement for video game fans, promising state-of-the-art rides, interactive areas, shops, and restaurants. One particular highlight is sure to be the real-life Mario Kart race course, huh. where pairs of riders will sit in carts running on a rail with one controlling drift and the other concentrating on power-ups and weapons. <laughs> so keep your eyes peeled for those pesky bananas. The park will open at Universal Studios Japan in 2020 in time for the Tokyo Olympic Games. Nintendo and Universal Studios first unveiled the plans for the park back in 2015, but now they've revealed a sneak peek. It looks like, unsurprisingly, Mario will be the star of the show as the icon leads the charge and interacts with visitors. The teaser doesn't give away too much, but it does suggest that the decor will be very much like something directly out of the classic Mario games. This will be the first of three Super Nintendo theme parks to open, with plans currently in place to open two more in, ho in Hollywood and Orlando. Of course, a trip to Japan won't come cheap, but if you've already started planning for the visit to the Olympics, then you may want to leave space on the itinerary for this quirky day out. Speaking of retro gaming, uh, wow. nice. I think this is totally awesome. Why did it take them so long? I know. I'm really excited for the Orlando and Hollywood yeah. openings because that's a little, a little bit more home. accessible for me, mm -hmm. but oh, this is going to be great. Watching the videos of people there is going to be amazing. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. I, I can't help but wonder, though, if it may over time lose its novelty appeal. Jeff, no. Well, Jeff, I'm, I'm we're talking about RetroPie tonight. Well, I like, know, but our like, Odroid Go is so that we can play games from 1990. I, I get that. <laughs> but there, you would have to be aware of the that era of gaming to really get the novelty of it. If that park is around 50 years from now, are people going to, like, 
are are my grandkids going to go? Why is this so old looking, Jeff? Mm-hmm. I don't want to think about a world where people don't know what Mario is. I know. I just want to know if somebody legitimately slips on a banana, it, are they going to get upset? The or are they, gonna, or are they just going to say this, this is totally <laughs> That will make an incredible lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's take a real quick look at CoinGecko. Um, this is what the crypto market looked like as of 1,800 hours Eastern time on Wednesday. What is it? The 17th of April, 2019. Bitcoin... Everything's losing here, so yeah. uh, Bitcoin's down almost 50 bucks at $5,222.99 U.S. Litecoin is down to 79.74. Ethereum 166.84. Monero is down to $68.09 per coin. Uh, the little guys, Stellite is at 1.56 ten thousandths of a cent, and Turtlecoin also dropping uh, 0.4 ten thousandths of a cent at 1.6. Don't forget, if you are going to invest in the cryptocurrency market, it is always volatile and never closes. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for, for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. We've got another Kingston Data Traveler to give away. Love that thing. This thing is great. Yes, it is. We talk about data security and where can you put your data that is going to be safe. Well, this is a USB flash drive with a built-in, let's get in here, boom, keypad. You see that? So I actually have to punch my password in there in order to gain access to my data. Mm -hmm. Now... Similarly, somebody else who gets a hold of this, if I drop it in a parking lot or what, uh, what have you, they're not going to be able to access my data because they don't know my password. Right. right. If they try, it will inevitably, after 10 tries, wipe the data decryption keys from the device, negating the data entirely. Mm -hmm. So it is a fantastic way to be able to carry confidential data with you. So work stuff documents, mm -hmm. passwords, whatever else, um, cryptocurrency keys, things like that. Like, a perfect place to store them is on a Kingston Data Traveler 2000. One of the things I like about that is that the software is on board the USB itself it so sure that is. any computer you plug it into, it works. You and don't have to download that software. 256-bit AES encryption hardware base. Yes. And you don't need, as you say, you don't need to install any software because it's all built into the hardware. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's very nice. What that opens up for you, um, we've talked about it on the show, but if you haven't seen it yet, um, what that means is because you don't need any software to decrypt the data here, you just need to punch in your password, it will work with any device. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're on Windows. It doesn't matter if you're on Mac, Linux, and even if you want to plug it into an Android TV box or a smart TV with your JPEGs or your videos on it, it will still work because you're decrypting it on the hardware level. You don't need software, and that will, you know, it promotes the fact that, hey, your data is always encrypted. There's no having to set anything up. It's already there. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got some of those to give away. We've got one more left, uh, I believe it is. Um, in order to qualify, do you want to tell them how they can qualify to win this? You email contest at category5.tv and in the subject line, you say Kingston. Kingston and, you know, then you're in. <laughs> Give me, oh. give me a data traveler 2000. Say, say something like that. Say <laughs> Anything please. Anything in reference. Yeah. Just let us know where you're from. <laughs> yeah, we want to know where you're watching. Yeah. Um, so that when you win, we can give kudos out and shout out. And exactly. uh, and just let us know that it's for the Kingston draw. So that it, And the reason we say that is because if somebody were to cast a ballot six months from now and we don't have any left, we know that that's... Oh, sorry. We're, yeah. we're, we're out of them. Yep. Yeah, that's how it works. But that's that's uh, all the time that we have um, this week. I want to say thanks to everybody who's been pitching in. I'm, we're really, really close to being able to replace our broadcast system. Excellent. Um, it's a lot of expense. It's going to be a lot of work, but that means a lot of fun because we're going to be uh, building this, uh, this Wirecast broadcast system here on the show. Um, if you'd like to contribute to that project, uh, head on over to donate.category5.tv or become a patron at uh, patreon.com slash category5. That's a great way to support us because you give as little as a, uh, a dollar a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we have so many viewers, I mean, inevitably, that, that just becomes a, a great big number. And to you, it's just as little as a buck. Yep. And, uh, you know, so... 
it, it works out really, really well. <laughs> it does. And, and that gives us a chance to be able to upgrade the studio. And, and uh, our main goal right now is to replace that um, server because we do have a dying uh, broadcast server. We want to be able to replace it. Um, so don't forget, we are on Twitter at Category 5 TV. I'm on Twitter personally, at Robbie Ferguson, and I do follow back. Those of you who follow me, if I haven't followed you back, just send me a quick message and I will do so. Uh, we're also on YouTube as Category 5 TV. Just do a quick search. Or if you want to watch little edited down snippets of the show, mm -hmm. this is a very popular thing. We just hit 20,000 subscribers. Thank you for subscribing at linuxtechshow.com. Uh, we're also on the Roku channel store, and you can get us on Plex, Kodi, um, other players. Uh, if you head on over to our GitHub page, um, like our repositories there, if you go to github.com slash cat5tv. Of course, our main website ties everything together. We've got RSS feeds. We're practically anywhere. So... <laughs> Hey, if you want to watch, if you want to listen, we're podcasting, we're vodcasting, whatever you want. It's all at Category5.tv culminated together there for you. So that's all the time that we have for this week. Next week, we are going to be unboxing the world's biggest Raspberry Pi screen case. Ooh. Or at the very least, the biggest one we've ever seen. <laughs> okay. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Bye.